Hi, my name is Rich McHugh, and I'm going to lead this workshop on generative AI for student research. This is an outline of what we're going to cover. Uh, most of our time together will be spent doing active learning with AI tools, but for 10 or 15 minutes now, I'm just going to provide an introduction to the topic. First off, uh, have you used ChatGPT before or any other generative AI tool? If so, what is your current skill level with the AI tool? And again, this is just to help uh, me as the instructor to figure out where people at and tailor the workshop to uh, the needs of the group. But does generative AI work? Uh, sometimes it can work really well. The very first time that I used ChatGPT way back in December 2022, I was shocked at how good the answer was to a question about a topic that I've been doing pretty extensive research on. And it didn't have any errors or anything, which was really surprising, or I guess wasn't surprising at that time, but in retrospect was quite surprising because, uh, yeah, the the summary that ChatGPT uh, created was, was excellent. But it isn't always excellent. So for example, in the uh, early 2024, a lawyer used ChatGPT to help create documents for a lawsuit and submitted them to the court. And uh, it was found that a number of the quotations uh, in the documents submitted were hallucinations or fabrications by ChatGPT. Uh, they were documents that existed, but it fabricated quotations from those documentations, and the lawyer had to pay all the expenses related to the confusion caused by their uh, inappropriate use of ChatGPT. Probably damaged their reputation pretty severely, too. So just a quick overview of artificial intelligence, uh, focusing on general, generative artificial intelligence. Uh, ChatGPT and other generative AI tools are not intelligent. Um, ChatGPT, as it says in the quote, has no intelligence. It doesn't know anything. It doesn't understand anything. It plays games with words to make plausible sounding English text. But any statements it makes are liable to be false. Uh, it can't avoid that because it doesn't know what the words mean. It, in other words, uh, generative AI tools weren't built to be factually based. They were built to... Uh, understand or not to understand but to reproduce natural sounding language so this is a diagram that help us helps us situate where generative ai lives in the larger artificial intelligent ecosystem so for example uh, we've got machine learning here we've got deep learning here and large language models sits at the intersection of machine learning and natural language processing and it is used by tools like ChatGPT, Copilot, Gemini, and Google Gemini, for example. And we've all been using generative AI for quite a while now. So for example, writing on your phone, uh, your phone tries to predict what's coming next using uh, basic generative AI tools, for example. Google Search has also used generative AI for quite a while to try to predict what you're going to type next just to help speed up your, your searching. And this diagram is a huge oversimplification, but it's core, it's generally speaking what happens with generative large language models. They predict what word or sentence uh, or even paragraph comes next using huge statistical models with huge, huge, huge data sets. Unfortunately, uh, currently general purpose generative AI tools like ChatGPT are like an overeager and overconfident intern who will make up plausible sounding responses, including fake quotes from experts in a field and fake citations in order to uh, respond to you and to help you with the question that you've asked it. So can, uh, can I or can you use generative AI for research assignments? That really depends. First of all, does your professor allow the use of generative AI? And if so, what parts of the research uh, assignment uh, do they allow it for? And we'll get into more detail with that in a sec. So here's a, uh, a flow chart to help us figure out whether or not generative AI is, is appropriate for you with a specific assignment. So first off down here, uh, does your instructor allow the use of generative AI? If no, well then you shouldn't be using it. Uh, if they do allow it for parts of it anyways, 
uh, does it matter if the output is true? If the answer is yes, uh, you should ask yourself if you have the expertise to verify that the output's uh, true and accurate. Uh, if no, then you probably shouldn't be using it. If yes, then are you willing to take full responsibility for any missed inaccuracies? And if yes, then it's possible to use uh, generative AI, um, assuming you met all those other uh, criteria. So let's look at some uh, generative AI lit review tools or literature review tools. But we'll start looking at the digital research tool just to contextualize it. So traditional search engines or library search engines collect uh, millions of peer-reviewed articles, and then they allow you to do keyword searches on those articles. Uh, and this is what all of us are probably quite familiar with. So how could we potentially use generative AI in a way that traditional uh, academic search engines aren't nearly as helpful. First off, they can be great for brainstorming, and this is often one that uh, professors will allow their students to use. Next is topic exploration. Next, literature review, and again, this is one that uh, if that's often uh, allowed by professors. Uh, research question formulation. Now we're getting into the territory where some or more professors won't allow that. And then writing assistance is usually not allowed, except for uh, purposes of uh, helping people with uh, some sort of a, a disability or, or a issue like that that they may have. So each assignment, even from a specific professor might have different uh, rules around what's permitted and not permitted. Um, and again, if your professor doesn't allow generative AI for at all in an assignment, then you should should not be using it, of course. And that would be a violation of ac academic integrity rules if you did use it. So one of the uh, one of the the first tools we're going to look at is Symantec Scholar, which uses generative AI to create summaries of journal articles, which can be really helpful, of course. But I wouldn't depend on the summaries, uh, but they are typically better than general GI, uh, generative AI tools for summarizing, like ChatGPT. But they still can make stuff up. Next one is Elicit, and it'll create summaries of the content of the four top articles, a combined summary of the four top articles, uh, which can be helpful. Again, I wouldn't depend on it, though. Next one that we're going to look at is Research Rabbit, and it allows you to make connections with the articles you've already found. Uh, with other similar articles, which can really be useful for uh, a literature review to help find articles that maybe didn't come up uh, very high on the uh, in a traditional library uh, search engine. And it'll give you a map of the how the articles relate with to each other. Unfortunately, this was just one article, but if you have multiple articles in a little library there, it'll show the connections between the articles that you put in the library as well as other related articles, which can be really quite cool. So what about ChatGPT for, for research purposes? It's not really built for that. It was trained on a massive uh, data set that includes a lot of non-academic text, and it is prone to hallucinations and errors. So for example, out of 115 generated uh, references, 47% of them were fabricated, and 46% were authentic but inaccurate. And some, t uh, it, they, they don't always provide sources for references as well, which can be uh, make it more difficult to verify them. So uh, how should we be citing generative AI tools? Um, your professor may give you specific instructions. So in that case, always follow your professor's instructions. Uh, if they don't give you instructions, we'll give you some, uh, some general guidance as well as what the different style guides uh, uh, we'll have to say about them, like APA, MLA, IEEE, etc. So if you don't have instructor guidance, generally speaking, you should save a transcript of your chat, including prompts, include the chat uh, transcript as an appendix to your work, include the date of your transcript if it isn't embedded in the, the transcript, and you need to acknowledge the use of the tool uh, at some point in your, uh, in your paper. Uh, probably at the, at the top would be best. Here's some comparisons between the style guide um, guidance. I won't go into detail here, but you can look at this in more detail in the activity. And there are res resources that the library has provided uh, that provides us with 
uh, so you can go deeper and get more details. And again, this is in the, uh, in the activities, so you can uh, check these out and refer back to them later, of course. So just as a review, uh, you do need to check with your professor to make sure that they allow generative AI for the assignment. I can't uh, emphasize that uh, more than that. You, you just have to do that, or you could be in violation of academic integrity rules, which can be uh, not a fun process to go through. So uh, limitation and reliability in generative AI. Um, Generative AI data, data sources for these library-based tools. So Semantic Scholar, for example, uh, which is also what Elicit uses, use web scraping from open access data, as well as uh, agreements with 50 publishers. Research Rabbit, it uses the Microsoft Academic Graph, which isn't uh, maintained any longer, but they do use more specific academic-focused fo training data. Just a note, uh, if a lot of the training data, especially for the general tools, have biases built into them. And um, just be aware that, you know, ChatGPT, uh, Gemini, Copilot, they all tend to have a bias for uh, the global north and the United States in particular, as well as English language. Uh, there are also racial and gender biases inherent in the, uh, in the data that it has scraped from the web. So need to be aware of that uh, as you critically evaluate the, the outputs of generative AI tools. An example here, we've got used a, a generative AI tool to create a photo of three CEOs and we have three white, um, three white male CEOs. Um, we'll talk a little bit about this and the activities about how we can counteract some of those biases. So this is an example of an illicit uh, summary using illicit, uh, but it made some factual errors in summarizing at least one of the articles. And I won't go into detail, but even these, uh, these research specific tools will make mistakes. So you can't depend on the summaries that they generate. You need to go look at the source uh, papers and make your own summary if it's something that you're gonna be using in your, uh, your research. And then even Elicit admits that their tool makes mistakes. They, they try to do their best, but it will make mistakes. So just keep that in mind. In terms of responsible and ethical use, uh, some of the things we should think, be thinking about when we're looking or using a tool is what data was that particular tool trained on? How does it use generative AI in the, in the research process? What are the capabilities? And almost more importantly, what are the limitations of the tool? And we need to check all of the outputs that we're going to use for, uh, for errors. And usually that means using a traditional index as well. So using AI for literature views, make sure it's not your sole source and don't rely on the summaries. Do your own summaries. Uh, make sure you check with the instructor for what's acceptable in the course. Um, Never pass off the work as your own, as that is academic, straight up academic misconduct. And uh, supervise uh, its use if you are using it to make sure that it's not making mistakes that you've uh, put into your course. Um, data privacy is another issue. We'll get into this in the hands-on activities, but uh, by default, most generative AI tools will take your prompts and use them as training data so that your prompt could show up in someone else's output from generative AI if it's a, uh, a similar question that they're having. There are ways to turn it off and uh, that off for most of those tools and we'll show you how to do that in a couple of them. So want to learn more? Uh, we've got some great libguides uh, that you can um, learn more about generative AI tools, specifically research. And here's a link to it here. And again, in the uh, hands-on activities, you'll get links to these as well. So let's start practicing using our new tools. And if you go to lib.uvic.ca slash genai, you can start working through the hands-on activities.